Hello and welcome back to Calculus 2. We are going to end chapter 6 with a bang, right? Because we are working with physical applications. That means integrals in physics. The first integral that we are going to consider is the integral for the mass. Now, a lot of formulation about what mass is, and you go and you watch advanced physics shows and all of that kind of stuff, and they talk about Higgs and a whole bunch of cool things. Um, what I like to do is to simplify all of that, and I just say that mass is a quantification of physical existence. Physical existence in our real world. Something that you can pick up, something that you can punch, something that you can right uh, change modify whatever so what has mass anything that has physical form uh, electrons have mass very 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 tiny sun has mass in comparison to us holy nightmare that's huge right our planet has mass uh, water molecule has mass so anything that exists in a physical realm has mass what are the massless things? Love. Love has no mass to it, right? It's a feeling or emotion. So completely irrelevant to what we are doing here, right? Now, in order for something to have mass, right, it has to have its physical presence. Now, everything that has a physical presence has some kind of a density. Certain objects are denser than other objects and uh, they will have different properties because they have different atomic structure so you have solids you have well all of that we don't have to go into actually into those details what i want to stress is that the the mass is density times volume And um, if you know what the density is and how much of the stuff you have, you calculate its mass. Now, mass does not depend on where you measure it. So when you measure a kilogram of bananas, it's a kilogram of bananas on Earth, kilogram of bananas on the moon, kilogram of bananas anywhere you measure. The weight is a force which depends on gravity. Therefore, the only thing you need to do to make yourself, for whatever reason, feel good about yourself is weigh yourself on the moon, right? Because you will have less weight because you're multiplying by smaller uh, gravity on the moon. So mass is density times volume. But we don't actually care about this formula too much because this formula uh, forces you to have forces you to have uniform density across the board, and that is something that we can cannot guarantee. Uh, uniform density is not very easy to achieve, and um, what we like to have instead as a definition of mass, which is what we are actually going to use, is that mass is the integral of density function. So, and then uh, this is going to, in Calc 3, upgrade to um, other uh, dimensions, so you can talk about two-dimensional, three-dimensional mass. So this is mass in one dimension, so this is just one-dimension mass. I'm going to, this is a formula, right, that's a formula. And it's just one dimensional mass. So what you're supposed to think of uh, here is the long metal or whatever rod. So this rod is length A to B, which are your limits on top. And you have the mass of this rod. So that's how heavy it is. You have the mass of this rod to be calculated by the integral where this uh, rho of x, rho is a Greek letter, replaces our r, 
uh, rho of x is density function. <coughs> so you observe object, you see how the density changes, you have density function, and when you plug that into the integral, calculated from A to B, it's actually, you get the mass. Now, you can do a lot of cool stuff with this. You're going to learn center of mass and all that good stuff in Calc 3, uh, in Chapter 16, I think. So, there is a lot of cool, cool stuff. Now, what I want to do here is uh, take a look at um, homework problem, let's say, to compute one of the mass integrals. So, what do they have? Let's see. Mass and one-dimensional objects. Great. Ooh, perfect. They have these. Uh, they have these piecewise ones. Perfect. So they give you in problem nineteen or twenty. Let's do twenty. It's it's worse. So rho of x, which is your density function, is given as a piecewise function x squared for uh, x's that are between 0 and 1 and then uh, x times 2 minus x if your x is in between in between 1 and 2 observe that the equal sign is not present over here because you can't have equal on both of these ones function over here governs this um, function that govern function that is um, active uh, between 0 and 1 is x squared and the function that is active between 1 and 2 is but you can include 1 into both intervals so it's, it's either in one or the other uh, the question is what is mass well you have a piecewise function, you have two pieces of a function, so you have to compute each one individually, and then you add the two masses. So your first integral for mass 1 is going to be the integral from 0 to 1, because that dx is stuck between 0 and 1, and your function rho is x squared, and you have dx. So this is x cubed over 3, computed from 0 to 1, and when you plug in 1, you get one third, and when you plug zero, everything goes away. The mass of the second part is given by integral one to two of x two minus x dx. So how do we integrate this one? Distribute the x. Excellent. We distribute the x, we get two x minus x squared, and now we just use the plus 1 equation, right? So it's going to be 2 times x squared over 2. And then 2's will cancel. And uh, you have um, minus x cubed over 3. And this is computed from 1 to 2. So what do we have? We have 2 squared minus 2 cubed over 3 minus uh, 2 cubed over 3 no 1 mm. so 2 2 minus 3 and now minus 1 squared and minus and minus gives me a plus and when I plug in 1 I get 1 third all right Finally, so that's 4 minus 8 thirds minus 1 plus 1 third. 4 minus 1 is 3, and you have 8 negative 8 thirds plus so it's going to be negative 7 thirds. Two thirds, right? Ta da! 
So the mass of that was two thirds of a kilogram. Does anyone know what the unit for uh, for mass is in Imperial, in US? So I told you your pounds. Hmm? Slugs. Slugs, nice, good. Nice. All right, so the next concept in physics that we are going to cover is called work. Now, basic physics has defined work as force times distance. But we are no longer in basic physics, right? So, it is completely natural to have a variable force as you are doing the work. Think about, I don't know, pushing a fridge across the floors to move it into the bedroom because you want to paint the entire kitchen and retile and do everything, right? Fridge is going to go out. You got to push that thing throughout the house. Now, being how much you talk in class to others, you have no friends, so you are just pushing it alone, right? So now, uh, think about this. You have, you ate, you're ready, you start pushing. Great, fridge is gonna go, eventually you're gonna get tired, right? So the graph for the force that you are exerting in time to push the fridge is, well, this is, you You haven't even touched the fridge yet, but your hands are moving towards the fridge. You make the contact and immediately it spikes up, right? And then you are pushing, 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 and then you start getting tired, right? So is this constant form, force? That's not a constant force. That's some kind of F of X force, right? Because you start all pumped up and then as you are getting tired, you start losing the strength and whatever. So the force with which you are pushing this fridge across your house is uh, less and less and less diminishing in, in time. So clearly the physics, basic physics formula is not good anymore because um, we are going to have varying force. Now, as you start understanding physics, your integral a to b is covering the distance. Integral a to b dx, that's just one dimensional uh, and it's just distance because uh, you are covering a to b and there was no function to integrate inside, therefore you are not integrating uh, function times dx to get area. So if you have an empty integral, it only calculates the length in a linear fashion going forward. So now, if you understand that integral a to b dx gives distance, then immediately you can see that formula for the work must be integral a, b. You stick the force function inside and multiply that by dx. So this is your physics formula calculus-based formula for work where your force is variable force. So I don't care whether it's you, whether it's the car or a tugboat or whatever, right? The force will vary for whatever reason. And if you'd have the function for that force, you can uh, calculate the work amount of energy that it's in the system. That's what the work is. So now we want to calculate um, next concept here is to calculate work done by a spring. So the book focuses on these kind of things because they are very simple and we don't have to do too much, uh, you know, physics details because you have physics courses and obviously if you're interested or mechanical engineer, take those courses. So now. If I have a spring, just like the ones you have in your pen, 
attached to some kind of a object that it's going to be pushed or pulled by that spring. The spring is in equilibrium when the spring is relaxed and uh, that's exactly at one point and one point alone which is when you take the spring you put it on a desk and you move away and uh, that stretch the length of the spring is its natural resting equilibrium state as soon as you either compress or stretch the spring the spring immediately wants to do the opposite right so you stretch it the spring is pushing out uh, sorry you stretch it the spring is pushing in you squish it it's pushing out and same like a rubber band always in opposition to what you want to do well they're useful for that purpose right so now we can measure the stiffness of the spring because imagine going to a train yard and salvaging one of those springs that they have in the wheels which are you know 100 pounds and or 200 pounds and they're like that and stuff those springs into your pen and then you try to click it right it's not gonna go too well right so you take a look at the spring from the shock from a, from a train and you take a look at the spring from your pen they look the same right it's the same spiral what's the difference between the two well material they're made of and that is and how thick and everything right which means that one spring is going to be a lot stiffer than the other spring and we can measure that stiffness through uh, what we call a spring constant so now we have a spring constant k that would measure the stiffness of the spring whether it's the you know pen or the car or the train or whatever else whatever kind of spring you can find so uh, Hooke's law is going to give you the uh, equation which connects the force which you need to exert to compress the spring for certain amount of distance so Hooke's law in physics says that the force with which you are compressing the spring is equal to the negative K delta X now we are going to use this equation because look you have your force now does the spring compress linearly and the answer is no just like the rubber band does not stretch linearly at the beginning it's very easy to stretch and then when it gets up to its limits it's harder and harder to stretch and then eventually snaps the same thing happens with uh, with the spring very easy to compress it a little bit very hard to compress the spring all the way so it looks like a solid tube right because usually it kind of wiggles out and just jumps out right because it is less energy for it to wiggle on the side and jump out than to actually be compressed all the way all things in nature tend to be in the lowest energy state so if it's able to wiggle out for whatever reason it will wiggle out rather than being compressed all the way so it's a one solid uh, cylinder so or oh, there's another uh, which is why you're not supposed to charge your cell phones all the way to 100 percent it's it's difficult to stuff those last um you know percents like after 93 94 percent uh it's it's tough to because you are already you know you're trying to stuff more energy in something that's almost full so it does deteriorate your battery if you go all the way to 100. the sweet spot to keep it is about 50 to 90. if you are able to maintain your battery um I have some batteries that are lasting me almost 
10, 15 years of charging it like that. Drops down to 50, charge it, charge it, charge it, as soon as it, as it passes 90, disconnect right away. No need to go to 100, right? Because chargers and electricity are available everywhere, right? You don't have to drain it all the way. So again, a lot of effort, right? To get, you use a lot of effort to squeeze out when you get to the bottom of the drink, right? Because you, can, you cannot do this anymore. That's not too much energy. You gotta go the go, oh, oh, right? <laughs> so it's a lot more motion and more tilt and more everything to get that last sip. So it's just natural between the spring and all of these things. It's, it all acts the same. Everything tends to be in the lowest energy state, which is why laziness always wins over productivity. The lower energy state. That's why mathematicians are so important. We provide laziness, <laughs> right? Generalize, 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 generalize. The more math you do, the less other work you have to do. Very simple. What do you mean? You know, so, you learned a lot of math and now do nothing all day long. So, um, so now we have the Hooke's Law, and the Hooke's Law gives us the force as a function that depends on the stiffness of the spring, which is your K measured in newtons per meter. Newtons per meter. So how much force do I need to stuff into the spring to compress it for whatever amount of meters? Now, obviously, it's few millimeters, but you can convert that into 0.0, .0 blah, blah, blah. So I have the Hooke's Law. And now that I have the Hooke's Law, I can say that the work done by spring is going to be integral A to B of f of x dx, where f of x is this function up there. So I technically have A to B of negative k delta x dx. So this is what physics loves to do, right? To pile one equation into another equation into another equation until you lose track of what's going on. <laughs> so what do I have now? I'm going to have a spring that has certain stiffness, which I'm going to calculate. And then we're going to calculate how much work needs to be done for that spring to move things around. So, the force that is used to stretch or compress spring, uh, the force needs to be larger than zero to uh, stretch the spring because you are adding the energy into the system and now the spring is no longer in equilibrium and uh, the the spring wants to, if you let go, the spring wants to go back, wants to compress back into its original state. On the other side, force is less than zero. You are, by, by compressing the spring, yes, you are still using your muscles right, to compress the spring, but actually what is happening from the spring's perspective is that you are adding energy uh, in the uh, system and then it wants to expand to use up that energy and go back into its original state. Same thing with the rubber band. So now, in order for us to compress a spring, you use the Hooke's Law first to calculate the amount of force necessary to, uh, to calculate your, uh, your spring constant and all of that stuff, and then you can uh, calculate the um, you can calculate now I'm, I'm looking at the at the book and I'm looking at the equation that I gave you and I use the delta x and then I use dx and I am fully aware that I told you earlier that delta x and dx are the same but this is notation for physics so the dx is the calculus dx which is the part of the integral, and this delta x is just simply the difference of location x1 and x2 for which you compressed or stretched. So when I peek now in the book, they do not use delta, they just put x. So I'm going to go into 
in here and just delete all of these deltas and just gonna call it kx the same way they call this uh, in in physics um, in the textbook that way there is no confusion um, with the meh notation we we used before especially in calc 1 all right so let's take a look at the problem uh, it says uh, compressing a spring suppose that force of 10 newtons is required to stretch a spring 0 0.1 meter well if you have a 10 newton force 10 newton force and uh, compression was 0 0.1 meter you can put that into the Hooke's law equation and calculate that 10 is equal to negative k times 0 0.1 from where you get that your k is equal to 100. Now you, you will, you're going to say, hey, what happened with that minus sign? Why are we ignoring that? Well, the minus sign is actually just something that the physics would use to deal with directions. See, in Hooke's law formula, you don't need that minus for calculations. In Hooke's law formula, uh, the negative is there to emphasize that the spring always wants to oppose the motion you, or the force you exert on the spring. If you compress, spring wants to go out. If you stretch, spring wants to go in. So the minus sign is there just to tell us the nature of the spring, which is always oppose. Whatever, whatever is happening to you, just oppose it right so the constant the spring constant is measuring the stiffness and stiffness cannot be negative so you are keeping the k constant k 100 at all times and you do not have to worry about the negative sign at all because it's just there to make the physics make sense when you explain these formulas so now what i have uh, if I, well, I can ignore the minus sign of formula as well. So what I have now is that the work done is A to B of 100x dx. So my K is 100 and then times x from the Hook law. And uh, I am ready to now uh, start stretching, shrinking, and do whatever I want. All of the stretching and shrinking for the spring will be uh, in those limits a and b the type of the spring whether it's a, a is a pen spring or the car uh, shock absorber spring right is all coded in this 100 right here so the type of the spring is in here so what a and b are doing is just telling us if we are stretching or we are shrinking right and how much that's all it does so how much work is needed to compress the spring 0.5 meters from the original so compress 0 0.5 meters great what you have is the spring that is happy at its equilibrium zero and here you are push it inside for no reason and clearly it's gonna go negative 0 0.5 because you pushed it in if you stretch it it's gonna go to positive 0 0.5 but because you are compressing the spring you pushed it in and it goes to negative 0 0.5 so i hope you all understand that right positive 0 0.5 versus negative 0 0.5 that's very important but there is one more aspect of this your limits on the integral are a and b a is the current state and b is the new state because it is going to be very weird for you now to see that the work is given as integral 0 to negative 0 
you are not used to see the smaller number up there, right? Of 100x dx. So, the reason why it's done this way, again, is because, guys, Spring was happy sitting there, and it would sit there with its zero stretch or shrink or anything, right? Forever, if you didn't show up to bother it. So, in the beginning of time, Spring was happy, and then you are bothering it. And you can bother it in the two different ways. Compress it to the negative side or stretch it to the positive side. Okay? So that's the, that's the deal. So you have to be careful about those two concepts. First, are you stretching or shrinking? So you have to well, compressing or stretching to know whether, the, whether you're going from zero to a negative or zero to a positive. Now, your problem could stay that your spring starts stretching, starts out stretched, and then you need to stretch it more. That was great, we can, and thank you. Yeah, question. Thank you. Thank you. Massive, like, like, like everyone stand in line. Like one, just one swing. And He's volunteering this time, but he doesn't have to stay home playing. I don't know. He's just awesome on that. Uh, so now you have the state where I can say I already stretched the spring point two. I want to stretch it additional point three. So. You are at point two, so 0 0.2 now, and then additional point three, what do I put here? 0.5, exactly. Because from point two, where you're already at, to go additional point three, well, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.5. So you just have to be careful, right? Go back and forth in this video to make all of the sense of the limits. So now integral over here is 100x squared over 2 from 0 to negative 0 0.5. Uh, this is 50 on uh, negative 0 0.5 squared. See, it's going to die, the negative sign. It's going to die. Uh, minus big fat 0, no one cares. So it's going to be 50 uh, times 0 0.25, which is 5 times 2.5. Now, uh, this is 5 times um, 5 halves, 25 over 2 Newton meters for work. So now say that the spring is compressed. So this is where equilibrium is zero. Spring is compressed negative 0 0.2. And we want to find work to compress additional 0 0.3 meters. Well, your spring is already compressed 0.2. To compress it additional, that means you are compressing it here to negative 0 0.5. When you set up your integral for work, and you are only considering that much work, right? Because in whatever mechanical systems you have, your spring is starting at negative 2, negative 0.2. So your job is to understand how much more work needs to be entered into the system, right, to uh, stretch it, uh, to shrink it or compress it to the negative. So just we are just calculating the additional work done. So 
I am uh, going to have the integral from negative 0 0.2 to negative 0 0.5. It's the same spring, so 100x dx. And all of this is going to be equal to a number because you are able to integrate and get x squared. So that's the story of springs and Hooke's law. Your job is to uh, figure out uh, carefully uh, where is your starting point, where do you want to end, and then be careful about. So the, all of these problems have negative limits because we were compressing. They will all be positive numbers if you're stretching. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're compressing or stretching because you will always have a number times x. So the integral will always be x squared, and all of those minus signs will die anyway, right? Now the question is, how much energy is needed if you want to from, go from negative 0.2 to a stretch of uh, 0.7? So that's something to think about. Because remember that the energy changes, right? From needing energy to actually using energy and pouring energy into a system. So... So a lot of cool questions to be answered there. The next problem are lifting problems. I love these because they they open open you up to think about things that you probably never thought about before. Uh, as you're driving around. Is the car plus you getting lighter? Yeah. Why? The gas. The gas thing, exactly. You are converting gas, which is liquid, right? So you are infusing. The gas comes from dead plants and animals, right, from oil. It's been in the ground for hundreds, thousands of years. And now we just extract that. And then we explode those animals and plants in the engine block. And that moves us from point A to B. This is how pathetic we are as a species, right? <laughs> whatever you want to think of, yeah, whatever you want to think about, but that is, that is the car that you're going to sit in, right, in an hour or so. It's, it's going to take extracted dead animals and plants from the, from the ass, you're going to explode them in your engine block, it's going to turn your pistons and shaft and so on, and it's just going to move you from point A to point B at 27% efficiency. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's how pathetic it is. Yeah. Right? 27 of the best cars, 27% efficient. That means that three quarters of your $40 to tank up, three quarters of that money, so 30 bucks, is a waste. And only 10 bucks is what does all of the driving and all of your air conditioning and all of your music and all of your lights and everything in a car, right? Where Tesla, electric car, is 98% efficient, which means that the cheaper fuel, electricity, is going to be almost 100% converted into you driving around. So, of course, those cars are expensive because their efficiency is. So, it's not just, oh, I don't have to tank gas and I don't have... Because people say, I don't want to do it because it's too expensive because... You know, the gas is just going to be re replaced by electricity, but the car is twice as expensive. No, it's not. Cars is cheaper than actually what you're driving right now, because three quarters of your gas money is wasted. And over there, 100% of electricity is used up. So, so there you go, right there. You have the cheaper fuel, which is efficient at almost 100%, compared to your 27% efficiency that you get from a gas-powered car. Because a lot of moving parts, a lot of friction, a lot of waste in heat. You know how much it takes to heat stuff up? What's the temperature of your engine? 1,000 degrees, huh? How long does it take you to boil an egg on a stove, right? So it's a lot of energy from gas wasted into that heat. And then you have the friction with all the pulleys and all the belts and, and everything else that it's moving and clanking inside. Right? Replaced by one electromotor that is connected directly to the battery. Of course, you're going to get 98 efficiency, right? And you are not wasting any money when you have a car like that. So, there you go. 
All right, so going back to lifting problems. The reason why I asked you about the car is the whole system getting uh, lighter is for you to realize that, yes, you are converting gas into all of these um, other things, uh, which is one of them is covering distance, the other is heat and noise and everything else. Now, think of this. You have a chain, and then you start lifting that chain. What can you tell me about lifting the chain that was... So let's say you have six feet or seven feet, so you, you go like this, right, seven feet. Seven feet of chain um, on the floor, and you pick up the end and just want to do this. What can you tell me about the process of you lifting the chain? The force is going to increase the more you lift the chain. Or you're going to Excellent. More force. Excellent. Excellent. With every single, not just inch, fraction of an inch that you lift up, you're adding more links to that chain that, is, that are lifted. And the chain is becoming heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier as you are lifting it. So if you are able to lift uh, uh, the first 10 links with zero effort, by the time you lifted the whole chain, you are probably shaking. And it's not that you are becoming weaker as you are doing that. It's just that you are constantly increasing the amount of stuff that you are lifting. So the weight of the chain changes as you are uh, lifting the, the whole thing. So now, how much are you lifting, right? So when you think about this, you are going to have to lift uh, the so, this all has weight, and this pile has weight to be added as you're lifting it up. Now, you're lifting up, so we are only going to have a dy integral here, because you're not going to lift left and right. Makes no sense, right? You lift up. We are shifting our integrals from spring pushing left and right to you lifting a chain up. And uh, the work done to lift the chain. C to D for dy. Because you are lifting the chain up. Now, when you are... Uh, Considering other aspects of this, what is the what is the issue? What are you trying to beat when you are um, what are you trying to beat when you are lifting things? Gravity. gravity. Thank you. Gravity. Gravity is the weakest of all forces because you can lift things up. Electromagnetic force is way stronger than gravity. Nuclear forces in atoms, holy nightmare, those are stronger than, than anything. But they keep matter together. Of course they will be. Now, you need gravity in your equation because it's not the same to lift this pile of chain on earth and on the moon right at one third gravity mars is smaller than earth so it's gonna be easy right one of the issues for mars and having generations of people born on mars is lesser density lesser bone structure in terms of strength so 
if those people after two, three generations being born on Mars and start evolving with a weaker skeletal structure, move back to Earth, you can kill each one of them with a flick, like this. Take the head off, right? So the gravity is uh, is a uh, something that you have to beat. And now you have to lift this to certain height. So I'm just going to say I don't want to use a uh, L minus y. L minus y. And uh, oh, I forgot uh, I forgot rho. Rho dy is the mass. Rho dy is the mass. G is a constant, so we don't worry about G. Rho dy is the mass. Now, what, which term is making this chain heavier as you are lifting? Well, it's this one over here. The y is the variable, which is measured from bottom up. L is the length of the chain. And C and D is how far you're lifting. Maybe you just want to lift half of the chain. Great. C to D, half of the chain. So this is the formula for you to calculate when you are lifting something that is increasing in weight as you lift it. Does this apply to a pallet of bricks? No. Pallet of bricks is the same as lifting this water bottle. It's one unit. When you lift the pallet of bricks, you lifted the entire pallet of bricks. You're done. The chain, however, keeps adding weight because there is always more chain sitting on the floor to add more of those links. And each link has mass, which we calculate through rho dy. And uh, that adds mass. So as you are lifting up and up, more and more links are added and more and more mass is added, which means that you have to add more work in order to lift more. So it's a really cool uh, it's a really cool uh, formula and uh, let's say lift the chain lift a seven um, feet chain to seven feet height. What's the work necessary to do something like that? Well, the work necessary is zero to seven. You are lifting the entire chain. Gravity Is what? I heard 12. <laughs> Thank you. 32.2. Why? Why 32.2? Because I said 7 feet. What's your 9.8? 9.8, 1, and 10. I like all those, those three numbers, but they are in the wrong, in the wrong units now, right? Because that's meter per second squared, right? You need feet per second squared because this is seven feet. If I said seven meters, then you use your 9.8. You gotta be very careful about these things. Otherwise, remember how they nicely landed that rover one year when they did calculation in feet and programmed the damn thing in meters? We're using the same numbers. Yeah. yeah, it was just $1.3 billion, oops, but...
<laughs> print another one. 3D printing. <laughs> <laughs> just print more money and, and make another one yeah again uh whatever the the row for the chain guys is gonna be uniform row for the chain whatever the, the metal is uh it's made out of steel it's made out of iron it's made out of i don't know vibranium um the row is gonna be something it's constant you know what, I'm even going to, no, I, I wanted to put G in so you can see it. I'm going to leave row and say metal. Whatever. And then you have your 7 minus Y, DY equals to number times row. Is it Newton meters now? Foot pounds now. <laughs> Yeah. Got to be careful about those things. All right, good. That's that. How about we uh, pump some uh, gas out uh, of the underground storage? Every gas station has those uh, big tanks where the gas is stored under the, under the, the pavement where you park, right, to gas up your car. Uh, maybe you want to empty the water from the pool using a pump. How do you know which pump to use or to set up a pump to pump the water out of your basement? Because maybe your basement is getting a lot of water and then there is a drain, the French drain, around the basement collecting all of the water in one spot and then there should be a pump. If you just go and say, I like that one because it's yellow. Right? So, yeah, just go there and big, buy the biggest one, right? So, see, these things can be computed because when you compute work, you can compute the power. There's a formula in physics that relates these two things times time. So, when you want to buy something, right, you can do the calculations if you're not lazy. And uh, it's kind of cool that you can compute... Uh, how much work is needed to get the gas to a certain level, to get uh, the the water pumped out of the the, the pool uh, to get so 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 it's it's really cool and um, the work will depend on the geometry of the tank. So it's not just what kind of uh, you know how high up you want to bring it, but it also geometry of the tank, and geometry of the tank is important because gravity. You see, when you, when you uh, have the tank designed and placed a certain way, gravity can do a lot of work for you, and then you just need to supplement gravity. And then the emptier the container is, the harder it is to pump stuff out. Remember what I said, right? That last sip is much more effort than the first sip when you're in the, on a bottle, right? So the same thing goes for liquid that it's... Um, so let's do the pumping, pumping problems. And we're going to end it there. There's more. There's more, but we'll just end it with pumping problems. So what do you have? Let's say you have a cylindrical tank like this, that it's dug in the ground. And uh, on the bottom over here, you have a nozzle that is going to bring the the gas, water, blood, whatever you're pumping out through the through that pump. So let's say it's water. So if you know anything of physics and liquids and stuff, you know that this much you are getting for free. Okay? The same level, right there, the same level is what you get for free. So you only need to pump this much.
because the rest of the stuff on the bottom is free. So clearly the amount of work you need to put in is going to depend on how much stuff you have in a tank. Now what happens when your water level or gas level or whatever is near empty? Well, then you have to also cover this much, right? To pump. That's additional energy, additional work, right? So now, what is the equation for something like this? Well, the work necessary to pump this is going to be integral A to B. We have our gravity and we have our rho. Rho is the type of the liquid. You all laughed, well not all of you, but some of you did get a little giggle when I said or pumping blood. Well, is there a difference between pumping water and pumping blood? Yeah, it's called viscosity, right? It's much harder to pump blood than to pump water. And you should have some admiration for your body that it's pumping blood 24-7 from the day you're born till the day you die. Because it's pumping something that it's much harder to pump than water. Constantly, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right? All of the months, all of the years, for decades, right? Decades. It's very viscous, right? And it could be sticky and everything else. So that row is going to be the type of the liquid. And there is a chart that you get in engineering, physics, whatever, which says the water has a value of 1,000. The gas is going to have the value of blah, blah, blah. The blood is going to have value of blah, blah, blah. And then you are going to, right? So that's that. Uh, the next thing that it's important for this is going to be the cross-sectional area of the object that you are pumping. Because uh, area, in terms of uh, y, this is uh, obviously dy integral. I should have said a and b, I should have said c and d, I'm sorry. c and d, because you are pumping vertically up. So you are going up, so it's a dy integral. So you should said C and D there. So gravity, rho for density of the liquid that you guys are pumping. And now you have the area of the tank. And uh, that plays the role as well. We'll see when we do different types of problems, why and how. And finally, you have the distance in y which is the distance that needs to be pumped and uh, this one over here is your d of y this uh, red uh, measurement which is uh, how much above the level you have to pump up remember everything below that red line is given you to you for free courtesy of basic physics Yes. Oh, that's what we're going to do now. AY is going to be the area of the cross section. In this case, it's a circle because this is a cylinder. But if you take this cylinder and put it sideways, it's going to be a rectangle. Right? Because if you take your cylinder and you take the sword and cut it this way and take a look at the cross section, it's area. So every time, if you are to pump this water out of this bottle by making a hole over here, the, it's always the circle that it's coming down. But now, let's say this is flat and this is flat, and I put it this way. When I put the hole over here, you see that's straight, that's straight, that's straight. It's going to be a rectangle area that it's going down. So. The next problem is going to be a cone that looks like this, and you are pumping the water out. So now the cone over here 
is different than the cylinder because as this water is going down the cone, your cross section area is a circle that is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as the water is going down. Thank you for asking the question. Over here is going to be constant because it's the same circle coming down. When you have a conical area, there is much more volume when it's fat and less when there is no fat. Remember that the gravity is helping. So when it's, when it's fat and a lot of it, gravity helps, then there's not much work you need to do. If it gets skinny and not much, not much, uh, uh, there will be no much volume, no much weight, gravity will uh, pour, pour it less. You need to put in more work to pump, to pump it up. So cross-sectional area is very important. You are talking about the volume of the, of the whole thing because you are pumping the volume out, right? So you are looking for the amount of uh, liquid that you get. Uh, uh, you can also research, I'm gonna skip it because we already had a lot of these, uh, and it's not a physics course, but uh, the next one is pressure. Pressure is also important on the, uh, for, for, for area because if you build a dam, right, uh, there will be a pressure of the fluid against the dam. Now, if you put a paper there, it's going to break through because there's a lot of area and a lot of volume pushing that way. So, the surface area of the shape that's holding all that water is important, right? Uh, and then the bigger the surface, the line is open. So, the same thing over here just works at the 90 degree angle. Uh, guys, what you see before you is the formula that we are going to use to pump the liquid out. So, for this picture, say that our cylinder is the radius of, if it's a one meter radius, that means that the diameter of that storage is going to be my height. I'm almost two meters tall. So, if I say one meter, in radius, then the diameter of the base is almost is two meters. The height of the barrel, let's say, is I don't know four meters. That's twice my height. And let's say you are pumping this to a height of. 10 meters because the whole thing is dug into the ground for safety reasons so you are pumping in to the height of 10 meters and you know I have another height in here and that height is going to be the height of the liquid that is currently in the barrel and let's say that the height of the liquid is at 3 meters I gave you three different heights. We're gonna work with all of them. Well, not all of them. We don't care about four meter height at all uh, because it's not, it's not utilized in any way, right? We only care about the height of the liquid and the height to which we need to bring that liquid. Uh, that's all you care. Now, four meter height is needed for specifications because you need to know that you can stuff the liquid up to four meters, but at this case, it's at three meters high. So now if I quickly draw this uh, thing and put the nozzle over here like that, uh, label important things, the level of the liquid here is at three. This is where the zero level is, and this is when the 10 meter is uh, for the for where I need to pump it, let's say it's gas, so that's where it, that's the level of the 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 pumps. So what do I have? I have the work is the integral. I need to pump out. I want to pump out everything, so I'm pumping out zero to three. So pump all pump all out, all of it.
I can just ask to pump out one meter. What are my limits if I only want to pump out one meter? Two to three. Two to three. I am only going to pi pump two to three meters. Uh, if I want to pump only one meter of liquid of height out, it's going to limits are two to three. So I have my G, I have my rho. Those are constants. Rho is gas, whatever that number is. It's a thousand if it's a water. And now I have my um, cross sectional area expressed in Y. Well, it's just a circle, right? The cross section in this one is just a circle. So that's going to be uh, 1 squared pi, right? R squared pi is the area of the circle, which is the cross section of your, of your barrel right there. And finally, I have the distance to which I am pumping this, right? Which is all the way up to 10 meters. So 10 minus y is where I, where I go. And finally, dy. Now, as you can see, all of these are constants and numbers. You get to kick everything outside. Your g, your rho, your 1 times pi is pi. And all you need to do is to integrate 10 minus y dy, and that's a joke, from 0 to 3. So you have your 0 pi. of 10y minus y squared over 2, calculated from 0 to 3. Uh, 0 pi. And now yeah, I plug in 3, which is 30, minus 9 halves, and then minus 0, no one cares. That's uh, 60 minus 9, 51. So 51 0 pi divided by 2. Now, since this was in meters, your g, 9.8, 9.81, 9 or 10, I don't care which way you're going to do that, right? And then rho, what is your liquid? Is it a gas? Is it blood? Is it, is it water? You will put that constant in there from the chart. Pi, depending again on you, 3.14 or, or, or 3. And then you get a number. And that's how much work needs to be done to pump all of this liquid out. And then you convert that work into power, and you know which pump to buy. Power is watts converted into horsepower. So you know that the sub pumps that you are buying for your basement are a quarter horsepower, one third horsepower, half horsepower to pump the water up. And then you think, about the engine of the car, 150 horsepower, or 200 horsepower, or 300 horsepower, or tune it into 6 or 700 horsepower for certain, right? And then you think of your basin pump that pumps the water out at a quarter horsepower. These things are calculated, and which is why you're learning these formulas so that you can operate in the system, right? Guys, you need to calculate the fuel pumps. To, to inject the fuel for the rockets, fuel pump to inject the fuel, but they have to pump the fuel from the reservoir into your engine. You have the fuel pump, you have the fuel lines, they have the, the, the cross section, you have the uh, crazy shape for the gas tank because it just stuff the thing around the axle and everything else in the back of the car so that you can, right? This is not your, the gas tank is not this simple. It's not a cylinder. Imagine the cross-section things that you have to compute with the area of something that looks like a kidney, yeah. right? There's a kidney shape inside the car. It's made out of metal and hollow to put the gas in, but what is the, what is the AOY, right? You are, what you're doing here is a joke of a problem. Try to imagine this, what is it, what is this problem is to calculate what it takes to suck out all of the gas from the from the car, right? Because you do not get to eye anything in engineering. You don't get to eye things because they are trying to shave off cents on each box. 
to pack things in to send it across the sea. And you think that they're going to say, well, your design is, you know, almost $10 more per unit than it, what it should be, right? No, because saving a, a, a 50 cents to, on a box because you did optimization is extremely important to a company. Yeah, on your personal level, for your personal bank, you don't care about 50 cents. Why does the company care about 50 cents? For one stupid box. Yeah, because they have 100,000 boxes. 100,000 boxes for them to ship their stuff across the world, because we don't produce anything here, right? 50 cents per one box times 100,000 boxes is a lot of dough to save, right? Per product. So your fuel pump for the kidney-shaped gas, gas tank that's sitting around all of the curves that you have to worry about in a car is going to have a crazy calculation for this cross-sectional area here. And you are making sure that that pump is just strong enough to pump everything out, but not too strong to use additional materials and additional stuff to raise the cost of the, because you want to keep the cost of production down for two reasons. One, you don't want to make your car to be so expensive, so damn expensive that no one can buy it. The second is to also make sure that you are keeping profit so you can hire more people to develop a new car. Profit is an amazing thing. We need profit at all times. It's not something to be distributed for people that have no brains. Except for the idiots. Um, profit is needed to hire people that have skills to develop a new car. So you are competing on the market. That's where the profit goes. Profit is not something that sits somewhere on a pile just because we can have it, right? It's so research and development, which is why socialist countries suck. They have nothing. Because there's no research and development because everything is developed. Everything is distributed, right? You gotta think about these things. So when you are talking about pumping, right? Gravity is helping you for this much. Gravity is what's pushing this down, yay. Because as gravity is pushing this down, because of the area over there, it's raising this level to always be the same. So you only have to right, do that. So this is the term that is the one that you're trying to beat with. Right? This is the work being done because the gravity and this is actually helping at least for, for this part. Now I want to do a cone um, because that one is much harder than this, yet so simple uh, on a picture and simple shape. But it's harder because now you have to come up with a function for area. And then we're done. So now you have a conical tank with a hole on the bottom, with a nozzle that goes up. The radius of this is, let's say, two meters. The height is 10 meters for the whole reservoir. And you are pumping it up to the height of 15 meters. And let's say that this thing is full. So your limits for pumping are 0 to 10, because you are pumping everything out, it's full. Um, clearly you want a conical tank, because it's very easy to hammer it in the ground, right? <laughs> All right, so what do we have? Well, the easy stuff is work is 0 to 10 you are pumping all of the liquid out. If you were pumping five meters worth of liquid, then you would pump five to 10, right? So be careful about that. You cannot pump zero to five. There is always something in zero to five until you reach five meter limit. And then you start chipping on that one, right? 
So when you are pumping stuff out, you are pumping from top down, even though the liquid is coming out on the bottom, all right? So that's the easy part. Uh, G and rho, again, those are the players. A of Y, that's the tough part, leave it for now. And we have uh, 15 minus Y, dy. So this much is what you can set up without thinking. You don't have to use a lot of brain power to do that much. And now issue is, what are we going to do for this A of Y? Well, let's think a little bit about this. Uh, first of all, I know that the area is uh, some kind of a circle. So the area is definitely pi r squared. Now the issue is that uh, r is a function. And I need that r as a function of y, function of height. Because how big this circle is, how big the radius is, directly depends on how tall the water level is, or blood, or whatever you have in here, right? So, the taller it is, the bigger the R. The lower it is, the smaller the R. So clearly, R depends exclusively on the height. So now, if you take a look at the side shot of this cone, you just have one isosceles triangle like this, whose height y runs down this, uh, down the middle, and you know that this distance over here is 2, and you know that this distance over here, all the way down, is 10. You realize that you can just work on one of these triangles, so you can isolate this one triangle on the side, put the 10 and put the 2. Now, you understand that you can put arbitrary water level somewhere that will have unknown height r, an unknown radius r that depends on the unknown height y. So that's a snapshot in time. From this, you can write a proportion because you have similar triangles. What 2 is to R, that's what 10 is to H. It's a proportion. You can write this proportion in any way you want. Uh, you just have to be careful that you are combining the same elements. So, what 2 is to R, and 2 is in a big triangle, what 2 is to R, that's what 10 is to age. See, radius together, heights together, big triangle together, small triangle together. Now you can rearrange this as any way you want. They just have to be perfectly stacked like that. So now, I can solve this 2 age is 10 R, age is 5 R, and because I need R in uh, age, sorry, Y, height, Y, not age, damn it. So R is Y over 5. So now my area in terms of y is pi times r which is y over 5 squared and I get pi over 25 y squared and that's what you stuff into the equation so work done is 0 to 10 rho g, g rho, whatever, and now you have your pi over 25, y squared, 15 minus y, dy. This is equal to rho g pi 
25 integral 0 to 10 of 15y squared minus y cubed dy. Well, these are polynomials, right? Joke to integrate. Rho g pi over 25. You have 15y cubed over 3. That will cancel. Minus y to the 4 over 4. Computed from 0 to 10. You are pumping everything out. Rho g pi over 25 is, cancel this, 5 times 10 cubed minus 10 to the 4 over 4, and all of that is equal to a number, in this case, Newton meters for the energy, right, for work that needs to be put into this to pump the entire thing up. So we have to use similar triangles. first few problems for pumping these things are of this caliber, right? Simple stuff. You want to pump out the pool? Oh, come on. It's a rectangle, right? Pool is a rectangle. So, no problem. What happened? By all means, please. How about you have, how about you have a spherical bottom? Right? You can come up with that equation. Uh, one problem that I remember I enjoyed, because usually the, the way I do it, I, I figure out this stuff and I get bored very quickly and then I flip the page, right, to see all of those terrible problems that no one ever assigns. And I remember spending a long time on uh, something that I have seen uh, in a village where my grandma was from uh, as a kid. Because, you know, when I was in uh, elementary school, middle school, and so on, uh, my parents would ship me off to my grandparents in a city that was about, I'd say, 60 miles away. And then uh, my grandparents lived in the city and worked in that city, but they were both from the village, first generation of the village. And then their extended families, brothers and sisters, lived in the, the villages, right? So they would send me there, and they had all of the animals and, and everything, and orchards and stuff like that. And that is where I saw uh, them uh, reusing things that I never taught, right? They would take a car tire, and they would slash it in half, but slash it in half long ways, right? Um, on the, the sideways, right? If, if, this is your, if, this is your, if this is your tire, you cut it this way to get two halves, and you can pour, you know, water and, uh, and food for animals to eat in that. They would also take barrels, right, that were barrels like this, and they would cut them this way, and then again, you have two halves, and you can put the food for animals to eat. Obviously, you just smooth out the edges because the animals will just, you know. Now, why did I tell you this story? Because one of the problems in, um, in the book, when you flip the page, is um, the, half cat, uh, the half cut barrel like that, and what it takes to, to get the water out. So you have technically, um, so I'm going to draw a, a face on one side, right? And then you have like this, right? And that, and then, right? So, so that's, that's the half of the barrel. The other half is on, on, on top and just cut off, right? And now you have the you have the water, let's say, after after rain, you have the water in this thing. And you just want to get rid of this water, but you cemented this damn thing in the right? So there's nothing that you can do. Ah, this is a terrible drawing because this is supposed to this is supposed to go like this over here so the water is supposed to hit there and hit there so now this is all water right you want to you want to pump this water out right so you have a nozzle now right here and whatever reason you want to pump it up whatever 
Do we all agree that it's just a rectangle that we have to worry about? Right? This is a rectangle right here. Isn't it? It's just a rectangle. So it should be just length times the width. Awesome. So you have your length times the width. So your A of Y is length times the width. Is there a problem with any one of these two, length or the width? Width. width. <laughs> right? Do you see how it's getting diminished by all, all on both sides? As the water level is going down, the width is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, and the width becomes zero when there is no more water. So there's no more, no, nothing to pump out, and the area also reached zero at the same time. How do you model W? So you realize that, let's say, this is a one meter radius. And that helps you a lot, because now you at least know that the face of that circle over there is x squared plus y squared equal 1. And that's when the center is right here. So now there, there's the chip. Now this is advanced stuff. And that's the challenge problem that you can go and break your head over the weekend and maybe you'll have a solution on Monday. Now obviously I know the I know the trick. I did not draw geometry that you need to figure out what types of equations to use. I we already dis discovered that this W is the issue. So this is stuff advanced stuff if you really want to learn these concepts and and, and struggle and, and think and so on. Um, other than that, you know, the other problems that were uh, there before, I think they have something with the piston uh, for the car, they give you the measurements and how much, right, stuff of energy and all that kind of stuff. So they have vanilla problems, which is what we did earlier, but stuff like this, yeah, try to figure that one out if you, if you are interested in, in more advanced stuff. Yes? What happened? Oh, the length is given uh, whatever the barrel is. Call the length, uh, I don't know, four meters, whatever. Uh, completely, length is completely irrelevant for the W problem, right? So you can call the length four meters, and the radius is one meter. And uh, this is something where you can really, you know, sit there and, 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 and wreck a couple of hours uh, trying. If you, if you don't see which lines you have to draw, uh, on the face uh, and then see what kind of equations and functions you can write. Uh, your job is to obviously um, write this W as a function of Y and then you will multiply that with L which is 4 and you will just have 4 W and that becomes a unit that you stuff into the integral times the rest. So the only thing that I want to know is what's the equation for W, right? Again, this is something that I would assign to an honors option section when I teach honors calculus too. They solve that problem as a homework exercise as the, right? So if you are interested in these kind of things and you want to try your your brain that's the stuff there is more in this lecture but i think you are completely burned out by now i, I see i see your eyes are just they lost the spark uh, on uh, monday and tuesday we will finish two sec uh, three sections from the next chapter and we are going to have a lab day for you guys to work on your lab one.
Uh, you can do all of the problems in lab one except the last problem. You will learn last problem on Tuesday. So hold off on the last problem. Do the other 11 problems with A and B. It's seven problems, but with A and B, it's actually 11 problems. So do those problems. And uh, we can set uh, Monday for you to you know, get in your groups, meet friends and talk and write names and so on. And uh, those who are not in a class, hopefully they show up because everyone needs a lab group and, and so on. So see you Monday.